13, where it says, how do I prepare my life for eternity? That's for our midweek. But page 12 is the space for notes. If you want to take some notes this week, um, you don't have to, but it is always helpful to kind of see what God is saying to you. Um, not too late to join a small group. We have them running on Tuesday nights and some on Wednesday. But uh, if you want to get a hold, if you want to find out where one is, ask someone who looks like they've been here a while where the small groups are and where they're meeting, and we'll point you in the right direction to those folks who are leading them and running them. But it's been, um, it's been incredible to see just some of the testimonies that are coming out of the small groups and out of those times together and just really reminded me of, of our need for community on different levels. You know, we need community in our families. We need community like this in a big group in church. It's good to see that you're part of something. Um, it's good to see that the, it's good to have community with, in between churches, where churches get together and move, but it's also good to meet in homes and small groups. Um, that kind of community is, is also very, so valuable. You know, we get to ask questions. Um, we get more involved in one another's lives. We know where we're at. We know what's happening. What are we praying for? How's this person? How's that person? And it really just reminded me again of, of how valuable those times are. And, and, you know, it is such a simple thing, but it is so profound that when we build God's way, we invite God's presence into that thing. When we build according to the patterns of God, His presence comes and dwells in those things. And the early church met together corporately, and they also met in homes. And so when we look at that, we kind of see the example, and sometimes we think we know better, but we, just, we really just need to be humble and follow God's patterns for building, and His presence is there with us. So this week, today's title is, I am a citizen. He is my king, you can put in brackets, but I am a citizen. And um, I, I trust that you've been enjoying this series and uh, that God's been revealing some stuff to you about your identity and, and who you are in Him and how you're made, how, how He's made you to be. You know, we said so much of, of, um, of the world tries to speak identity to, to us. And I got the chance to spend some time with Ian over the last two days and he we were just chatting over a meal, and he said, you know, it's so interesting to see how on social media <clears throat> you get all these influencers who are effectively leading people, sometimes with tens of millions of followers. And the followers are seeing what the influencers do and what products they use and what, how they dance and that sort of stuff, and then they're copying those things. And so they're effectively finding their identity in these people that they don't know online, and they're going like, hey, this is the latest trend. This is the thing I need to identify with. I identify with this group or that group or this person or that person and finding their identity in those things. And, and we all do it to a certain extent. But the beauty of what God says is that our identity is not found in anything in this world. It's not found in anything temporary. Our identity is found in the one who makes us and who he says that we are to be, whether we believe it or not. You know, we, we showed those pictures of the circles of what God says to be true and, and what we believe about ourselves. And those things overlap a little. And the, what we're trying to do through this is kind of overlap those more and more so that what we believe about ourselves lines up with God's truth. We're not trying to bend God's truth to line up with us. It's the other way around. We need to believe what God says about us. But I trust that if you've put your faith in Christ, that you are a son or daughter of the Most High God and you know that He is your Father. And a profound new identity that, that we are His servants and He is our Master and we get access to His plans. There's benefits to being a servant of God. And not only that, but as Dave shared last week, I am a saint. And what that means is that we are forgiven, that we are holy, that we are set apart, and that Christ is our Savior. And the, the deep truths of the faith that come out in that thing. You know, sometimes we see saints as those who are far, far off. And if I, we did it in our online group. Like if I said to you, think of a saint, who did you think of? Val Kilmer in the 1990s movie? Mother Teresa? That was my first one. That was like who I came up with. Or we think of St. John, St. Paul, St. the people who wrote the Bible. We think of like these super holy people. But the Bible says that you and I are saints. And it's an incredible revelation when that thing settles in my heart that God calls me holy. Because I know me fairly well. And I know that I don't always live up to that. But God says that's what, you, that's what you've got to live to. You've got to live to your identity. You've got to live to that thing of being a saint. And so this morning... Another new part of our identity is that we have a king, and we are citizens of a kingdom. He gives us our citizenship. And maybe, what citizenship do you hold? I know there's some people here that hold some different citizenship. Um, <clears throat> we've got various countries around Africa, Europe, any Americas or Asias? No Americas or Asias yet. Eh? No one got an 
Argentinian passport that we know of. All right. <clears throat> Me, I've got the green mamba. It's the only one I've ever had. Good old South African passport. That thing is deadly in Africa. It gets you in anywhere. But um, I don't qualify for citizenship anywhere else. Um, I, I haven't ever tried to get citizenship everywhere else. I love South Africa. I love Africa. I'm staying until God sends me somewhere else if he ever does, but it'll have to be pretty serious writing on the wall. But sometimes having that green mamba, it's a bit of a hassle trying to get into some other countries. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried, but you, to get your visa, sometimes even getting into South Africa is a hassle if you have a different passport. But <clears throat> I had a, um, you know, it's, it's an incredible thing when you come back to your own country. I remember the very first time I went on a missions trip, we drove up to Malawi from Rustenburg. Uh, so it was about 26 hours of driving in total. We overnighted on the, the second night, um, drove through the first night and then overnighted the second night. And, on the, and we drove back and Zim wasn't in a great state at that, at that time. They, they really were struggling. Um, their, their previous fearless leader was still alive. And it was, it was quite harrowing driving through Zim. Every, sort of few kilometers, there were police stops, and they weren't really trying to check if you were obeying the law. Um, they were just trying to extort bribes out of you, and so it was a fight getting in and out. The borders, uh, we were you know, coming through Nyamapanda, and Bite Bridge was an absolute dog show. And I remember coming through Bite Bridge, through the Zim side, and we made it out of Zim, and we got, you literally go across the bridge, and you go through the big South African side, and it was super easy, just stamp the passports and get going, get through. And I remember driving out of that board, and I wanted to stop the car and get out and kiss the ground, because there are yellow lines and cat size, and there's white lines in the middle of the road, and it was just like, I don't care if you stop me and try and arrest me, but I'm home. Like, I'm here. I'm, in, I'm where I belong. You can do what you like. I am where I've, I know that the justice system works, and I can get help if I need it. I'm back in my country. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing when we feel that thing. We feel that, man, I've come home. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. But no matter which citizenship you have or, or which one you'll ever get, and whether you hold dual citizenship, maybe, the Bible says that <clears throat> our earthly citizenship pales in comparison to our heavenly or our spiritual citizenship. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn over to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read another portion that Paul writes our main chapter that we've been working out of for this whole series is out of Ephesians chapter 1. It's in the front of your books, and I'd encourage you to read through that once a week. As you, as you get that, maybe just one day you're doing your devotion, read through that Ephesians chapter 1. There's so meaty and there's so much in there of what God says to us. But this morning, we're going to read out of Philippians chapter 3, and it's, a, it's another letter that Paul writes to a church that he had planted, a church in Philippi, and um, he writes this from verses 18 to 21. He says, for as often as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And here he's, he's talking about people that are, that are not believers in Jesus, that are, that are far from Christ, that have yet to put their faith in Christ. And, and that's honestly, friends, that's what we used to be, each and every one of us, before we submitted to Christ. We were those who were enemies of the cross. Verse 19, their destiny is is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. In other words, our highest citizenship used to be measured by everything of this world, by, by what happens in our earthly lives. Verse 20, Paul says of the church, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. There's a powerful message that Paul communicates there, that there are essentially only two spiritual kingdoms. I mean, two real kingdoms. We have lots of kingdoms on earth, but there's only two real kingdoms that count. And you can only hold citizenship in one of those kingdoms. You can't hold dual citizenship and not pay taxes anywhere. You've got to choose which one is it going to be. There's two kingdoms. And we get... One kingdom that Paul talks about first is the kingdom that's ruled by the devil. There's a kingdom that the, the, the citizens of that kingdom are defined as those who are rejecting the message of Christ, rejecting the good news. They live as enemies of the cross, as Paul puts it. Their mind is set on earthly things. That means success is all about this life. It's about the here and now. It's about what I can get now. How much can I earn? How young can I look? How, what makes me feel good? What do I own? How can I advance myself now? And this is what all of us were at some stage. 
But there's another kingdom, and that kingdom is ruled by the King of Kings. That kingdom is ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's only because of His amazing work on the cross that any of us have any hope of entering into that kingdom. There is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to make ourselves worthy into that kingdom. You know, sometimes in, in, um, in, our, in the earthly world, you can buy citizenship into another country. If you invest enough money into that country, usually poorer countries, you can buy citizenship into that. I've got friends that have bought citizenship into Mauritius. They still live in South Africa, but they hold a Mauritian passport because they invested in Mauritius. They bought property and started a business there. So they have effectively bought their citizenship there. You can't do that with, this, with the kingdom of God. You can't buy your way into the kingdom. You cannot earn your way in. The only way in is through faith in the cross of Christ. Faith in what Jesus has done is enough for me. By the grace of God, I can enter into his kingdom. And I, I don't think we'll ever fully understand that the king of kings was willing to sacrifice his own life to gain us, to buy us citizenship into that country, into that kingdom. It's a, it's a profound mystery that we'll work on for the rest of our lives at understanding and the rest of eternity. But there are three things that define the citizens of this great kingdom of life. And I'm going to run through the three of them quickly for us this morning. And the first one, and, and I think this is one I'm going to spend the most time on because it's the most important for us. And it sets us free to such a degree that it, makes, it just puts things in, prosper, in perspective. And the first truth that we have as citizens of this kingdom of light is that this world is not my home. This world is not my home. We live temporary lives here. I'm not going to be here forever. At best, I've got another 80 years. Because God caps it at 120. 77 years. This world is not my home. You know, in the book of Hebrews, in that great chapter, chapter 11, it's called the chapter of faith. The writer of the book talks about the heroes of the faith that has gone before. And he said there's one distinguishing factor about all of them, and they all knew that this world was not where their lives were going to be spent, that this world was not their home. Verse 13, he says, after speaking about Abraham and Moses and Isaac and all of them, he says, all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. It's incredible, huh? God speaks. We, we look at these promises that God gives in the Old Testament. We think, man, I'd love to have those things spoken over me, promises of Abraham, promise, Isaac, Jacob, promises... But they never saw those things come to pass. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Hebrews eleven thirteen to 16. I want to take note of two phrases that are in those passages. And the first one is foreigners and strangers on earth. Foreigners and strangers. And the second one is a better country. A better country. Sounds like what most of us are looking for. As citizens of heaven, there's a deep feeling in our souls that where we are now, we're like we don't quite fit in. We're a little bit weird. We're a little bit of the outcast. We're a little bit like awkward in some situations because we don't behave like the world does. And that's good. We should be like that. When you go to a, a foreign country, I was in a foreign country yesterday, and it's just different. Things just work a little bit different. The language is a bit strange, even if they are a, an English country or whatever. It's just the money's different. Like, does it work? Like, that's some of the customs and things. And when you're a foreigner in that country, it's, it's awkward. You, you kind of don't feel like you belong. It's just temporary. And so this was made very real to me yesterday as we were driving through. But it's, it's how we should feel here, even at home even in this world, that we are foreigners and strangers on earth. You know, some of us think very differently about this, and we, 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 we live completely for this, this world, and we build everything for this world, and we think only about this world. And many, many people who follow Christ do that as well. We, we, we miss that. We think that this is now, this is the time to make our, our lives good, and that heaven's going to be kind of a downgrade when we're going to have to wear white sashes with purple, you know, purple, white robes with purple sashes and play harps all day to Jesus. And it's going to be a lot better than that. That would be a serious downgrade if we had to do that. But we get to, we get to be with the King of Kings for eternity. Heaven is where we are made for. 
when we settle our citizenship are there, that we are sometimes, we're so earthly minded that we know heavenly good. And I want to challenge us that the truth is, is that the best that this world has to offer pales in comparison to the least of heaven. It's an incredible thing to think how close we are to our heavenly home. Many of us think that heaven is 80 years away, but we never really know how close we are. We just, it's a moment away from being our reality. And that's not a bad thing, that, it's, that heaven is close. You know, most of us spend our lives trying to avoid death. And that's also, that's not a bad thing. It doesn't say we should actively seek it out. But Paul says, I long to be with God. I long to depart and be with God. But it's better for you that I'm here. And it's better for us that you are here. But we should be longing for a different kingdom, a different home, a different country. Billy Graham passed away on the 21st of February, 2018. He was an incredible preacher and evangelist for many, many years. Faithfully served God. He's a wonderful example of a man of faith who used his gifts and his talents to absolutely advance the kingdom fearlessly and boldly. He died at 99 years old. And following his death, a statement was released on behalf of the family by, by Billy Graham's grandson, Will Graham. And he said this. He said, my grandfather once said, one day you'll hear that Billy Graham has died. Don't you believe it? On that day, I'll be more alive than ever before. I've just changed addresses. My friends, today my grandfather moved from the land of the dead to the land of the living. Today he had the opportunity to realize that hope himself kneeling before his Savior and hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, Billy Graham clearly understood that he was a citizen of heaven. Don't you believe that I've died? I've just changed. I'm, I'm living with God. It's an incredible truth. The Bible teaches that as a citizen of heaven, we'll get a new eternal body. It's at the end of that um, passage in Philippians where Paul says, we'll get a glorious body like Jesus' resurrected body. That body never grows sick. It never grows tired. It doesn't get depleted. This body, this one, gets sick and tired and depleted very quickly. This is like a tent. It's just a temporary place to stay. It's not, our, it's not a home. But the body that we will get was where in a kingdom where there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no bills to pay, no crime, no load shedding or problems with power. It says that the king himself gives light to that city. You see, this world is not our home. That one is. I'm not primarily a citizen of earth fighting my way through life, competing with the other just over estimated 8 billion people on the planet. I'm primarily a citizen of heaven with access to all of the king's vast supply of love and kindness, peace and grace. We don't have to try and climb a long ladder to get to God. As a citizen of heaven, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, bringing his kingdom here on earth. It means, because there are times when I feel like an alien and a stranger in this place, it means that we are not yet living in a country of our citizenship. The second thing, as a citizen of heaven, is that I have unique protection and benefits. Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, was written by Paul. Now, Paul had a, an interesting experience around citizenship. And in Acts 22, there's a story of Paul where we find out what Paul's citizenship really was on earth. And he says, it says in Acts 22 that Paul was arrested by some Roman soldiers in Jerusalem. And they're busy stretching him out to have him flogged. So they've chained him up and they're busy stretching him out to make his back nice and long so they can flog him and beat him for something that he had not done. And so while this is happening, Paul says this in Acts 22, 25. Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? He's referring to his own earthly citizenship. He's saying, I'm a Roman citizenship. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You see, Paul lived in the, the Roman Empire. And, and in the Roman Empire, although Rome conquered many, many nations, and the Roman Empire was massive, stretching across much of Europe and Asia Minor and even into North Africa, it not many of the people that were fell under the Roman Empire were Roman citizens. To be a Roman citizen was quite a unique thing. Only a very small percentage of people who lived within the Roman Empire were Roman citizens. And being a citizen of Rome gave you incredible um, privileges. It gave you prestige and status in business dealings and in society. 
but it also gave you protection under law. There were certain things that could and couldn't be done to a Roman citizen. It was almost, it was, it was almost impossible to crucify a Roman citizen. That was reserved solely for other people who weren't Roman citizens. And punishments and things came in a certain way. So the very, very wealthy could buy their Roman citizenship, but the best way to have it was to be born into a, Roman, into a, a family that was citizens. That was kind of seen as even, even more prestigious than having bought your citizenship. So Acts 2, 20, uh, 22, 28, the story goes on. The commander then went to Paul after Paul had said this. The commander goes to Paul and says, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. You see, this commander was alarmed and these soldiers withdrew because they knew that Paul had the full protection and the benefit of being a Roman citizen. The commander thus became scared for his own life because he realized he had broken the law because of Paul's earthly citizenship and what it meant. Now, when Paul becomes a follower of Christ and he realizes that his citizenship is in heaven and he writes in the, in the New Testament, he doesn't even, he never mentions that he was a Roman citizen. He never even says, I am fancy, I'm important, you should pay attention to me. It's Luke who's telling the story in Acts about what happened with Paul. So Luke reveals what happens with Paul. But Paul never considers his earthly citizenship a big deal. What he does say is a big deal to us is that our citizenship is in heaven. You see, he had access to all the benefits of Rome and the protection that came with that. But as a citizen of heaven, he knew that he and us have infinitely greater access to provision and protection from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Paul became a citizen of Rome by birth, and you and I become citizens of heaven by a new birth, what Jesus called being born again. And as such, when we do, we receive all the benefits that come with being citizens of heaven. That looks like, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. God says, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge, Psalm 91, verse 4. Matthew 6, 11, he provides for us daily the bread that we need. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And it goes on and on and on. The Bible speaks about what it is, the provision and the protection that God gives us as citizens of heaven. Whatever your view is of the United States of America, they are an incredibly powerful country, probably one of, if not the most powerful country in the world. And whenever war breaks out in an area of the world, America, the State Department, the first thing they do is they go and they find out if there's any American citizens in that place. And then they get those citizens evacuated. They get them out. And sometimes they send in military to go and evacuate the citizens out of that place. It doesn't matter whether it's just the pandemic or a moving out of Afghanistan after the war or whether a war breaks out in a small place. The government, the, the authority of that country goes in and fetches its citizens and says, we're going to protect you and we're going to look after you. How much more is the king of heaven watching over us? How much more does he care for his citizens? I was spending time yesterday. I just, I went for a, a, a quick run. And on that run, I just, I just felt lies of the enemy coming against me a number of times. He was lying to me about things. So stupid things too. So my boys were playing cricket in Durban and they were on a school bus yesterday while I was going for the run. The bus was on the way, on the way back. And so I'm running, and I just get these visions of this mad bus accident. I think, man, I've got to turn around and go home. I, got, I didn't have my phone with me, and I don't run with my phone, so I'm like, I've got to go back. And I, Accident. Boys have been hurt, killed on the bus accident. Said, no, man, come on. Nonsense. I'm running a bit further, and he lies to me about something else. And he said, yeah, this person doing this and this and that. Said, come on, man, what's going on here? I knew I was tired, but I didn't realize I was that tired. <laughs> Drink some water and have a gel and... But it's the enemy coming. And I just, I just felt within me that, that thing of the light of God well up. And honestly, that's why I remember that story about Andy, because that was what the Holy Spirit reminded me of. He said, in you is a light, and that light can cast out. So I'm running along, and with what little breath I've got left, I'm saying, yeah, Jesus, you are the light. Jesus, you cast out. The, the enemy has got no place to lie to me. I do not believe the lies of the enemy in this thing. How much more is the kingdom of heaven not looking after us? Friends, when we, go, when we go through troubles, when we go through difficulty, you know, God, 
God doesn't always pull us out of danger. In fact, sometimes He sends us into danger. He sends us into the, the fires to go and advance the kingdom or to go and rescue others. But when He's there, when we go in there, He's right there with us. He is there with us, leading us, guiding us, and protecting us. His power is always available to us. His presence is always with us to guide us. And His compassion is always there to carry us. What an incredible thing to be a citizen of heaven. Thirdly, as a citizen of heaven, and this is, and I said the first one was big and it was important that we get, but this one is the one that trumps it. I have an amazing king. Amen? I have an amazing king. Our citizenship in heaven is incredible because of the king. Because he is incredible. Paul says, Philippians 3.20, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to talk about Christ's power and how he will transform us. Are you and I in awe of this amazing king? Do we stand and look into the face of Christ and think what a privilege it is to be a citizen of, king, of heaven? 1976, a preacher called Shadrach Meshach Lockridge, Dr. S.M. Lockridge. I don't know why he didn't get a bed go, but his mom clearly loved the story of Daniel. He was an incredible preacher, and I've played the video for you before. I'm not going to play it now, but I'm going to say it. He preached a sermon in Detroit, Michigan that was entitled, That's My King. And if I want to encourage you, go on YouTube and have a look it up. He does it a lot better than I do, but I couldn't find one with decent sound. But it became a really, fi- a really famous sermon that he spoke about Jesus. It is one of my favorite passages and, and favorite sermons. And I'm going to end this message by reading out some of what he said that day. I'm going to try and do it how he did. He was a far more like charismatic, Pentecostal, like big, deep-chested guy. He was way more manly than me. The Bible says he's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's august. He's unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He's supreme. He is preeminent. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate and regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? My king is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors and the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes, and he's the king of kings, and he's the lord of lords. Now that's my king. I wonder, do you know him? What an incredible Incredible sermon and inspired. I mean, that's just a portion of his sermon. I wonder if you'd stand with me as we celebrate our king. That's not part of this. That's my sermon. That's part. So we can all stand. I'm mean, just going to spend a minute or two in prayer. And if you're unsure, if you don't know that you're a citizen of heaven, if that's if you're wondering, if you've never had that born again moment, if you've never had that moment of putting your faith in Christ. Just as everybody's standing here, we're all in a moment of prayer. Nobody's looking around. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And if you've never done that, if you've you've never considered yourself a citizen of heaven because you don't know the salvation that comes through Jesus, the simple yet profound truth, and the entry requirements are simple. Turn away from doing things on your own. Acknowledge that Jesus is the king of the kingdom and the king of your life and ask that king for forgiveness. And when we do that, we put our faith in him. You see, King Jesus loves you so much that he died on a cross to take the punishment for your rebellion and for your sin. If that's you, I want to ask you to respond this morning. 
If you've never put your faith and your hope in Christ, no one's going to shame you. No one's going to make fun of you. But if that's you, I want to ask you just to put your hand up now. If you've never put your faith in Jesus and you want to be a citizen of this great king and this kingdom, Amazing, awesome. I'm going to pray with you. We can all pray with us together, but we're just going to pray with you. Jesus, thank you that you are my king. Thank you that you have forgiven my sins. I put my faith and my trust in you alone. Settle this truth of my identity in my heart that I am a citizen of heaven. Make me your child, and from this day forward, I give you my life. And I commit to follow you every day, in every way. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me into all truth. Amen. Just as we stay praying. Secondly, if you are already a citizen of heaven, you know it. You know that he is your king. But maybe you're a little bit too concerned with earthly things. And we lose sight of the appreciation that we should have for this amazing thing that, is, that we are citizens of Christ's kingdom. I want to just take some time and, and thank him for rescuing us and committing us into his kingdom and commit ourselves to live as strangers on this earth. If that's you, if you want to respond, you can respond however you see fit. But just pray with me. You can pray just by agreeing or you can pray out loud if you would like. In this moment, I just believe that God wants to do some realignment and some, some overlapping of those circles of truths about our identity. And so, Father, where we have lived for this world, where we have lived for things that are temporary, forgive us, God. Where we have lost the awe and the wonder for our great King and Savior, Jesus, forgive us, God. We want to repent of being so earthly-minded that we are no heavenly good. We want to turn away from living as the world does. Come and make us again foreigners and strangers who yearn for another country, a better country, God. Jesus, we long for your return. But even now, we want to say, we declare that you are our king and we live in your kingdom. Make us bold, Lord. Make us bold to go into places to advance your kingdom. As citizens of heaven, let us carry a passport and an identity with us that is like no other on this earth. We want to live for eternity, God. We want to live for your kingdom that is eternal, not for the things of this world. So right now, God, we turn from living, from this day forward, we turn 180 degrees from living for the things of this world to being focused on you, Jesus. We want to keep our eyes on you each and every day. As the Israelites did in the, in the wilderness, following your pillar of fire and pillar of cloud, we want to be like that, Lord. When you move, we move. When you don't move, we don't move. We want to build our lives according to the patterns that you show us so that your presence goes with us, God. And we pray these things in the name of our mighty, loving, gracious King Jesus. And all God's good-looking people said, Amen.